Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Silla DB and InfoQ. My name is uh, Srini Penchikala. I am the lead editor at uh, InfoQ for the AI, ML, and uh, data engineering community. I will be the moderator for this webinar. Today, we are going to hear from Zach Leviton and uh, Konstantin Asipal from the Silla DB team. The presentation title is uh, renegotiating the boundary between database latency and the consistency. Let me introduce our panelists first. Zach Leviton is the vice president of product at the Silla DB. He has a degree in a BA and an MS degree in computer science. Zach has had a long career in development, systems engineering and the product management in the telecom and other domains. Konstantin Asipov is the director of engineering at Silla DB. He is a well-known expert in the database management systems world, spending most of his career developing several open source database solutions, including a Terran tool and MySQL. Zach and Kastia, welcome to this webinar. Before we go to the main presentation, uh, I would like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. The main presentation will be about 40 uh, to 45 minutes long. After that, we will have uh, a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session where the panelists will respond to questions from the audience. I'll be moderating the Q&A uh, throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions uh, during the talk, please submit them in the Q&A window on the webinar screen. Everyone's microphones except the speakers will be muted by default. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available in the next couple of days. Uh, if you uh, would like to watch it offline, uh, you'll be receiving an email with more details in the next uh, uh, 24 hours. I think uh, that is all for the housekeeping items. Zach and Kastia, I am going to turn it over to you now and I will turn off my video. I'm very much looking forward to the presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you, Svene. And uh, let's get started. Uh, so I guess uh, Svene already presented myself and Kostia, so we can get uh, to the business. So what is SilaDB? Uh, SilaDB is a company and a, a NoSQL database. Uh, SilaDB was designed from, from scratch for high availability and high performance. And by high performance, I mean both very high throughput. You can get to more than a million requests per second per node, but also a very low latency. And Scylla can keep with a sub millisecond a P99 a consistency. Uh, which is very important for an uh, application we use consistency or rely on consistency to deliver value. There are three main variants that you can consume Scylla or SillaDB. The first is open source, go to GitHub, look at the code, download the code, compile the code, send patches, you, you are more than welcome. The second is enterprise, it's a closed source version a heavily rely on the open source, so 99% of the code is the same, but with some extra feature on performance, security, and other. And last but not least is a, a database as a service or a cloud option, uh, which is basically the same as Scylla Enterprise with the difference that we are managing it for you. And it's, it seems to become more and more popular these days. Uh, the API that you, you use, Scylla, we ha actually have two API. One of them is compatible with Apache Cassandra. It's called CQL. The second one is compatible with uh, AWS DynamoDB. Uh, so you can use either, and you can use either drivers uh, to connect to Scylla. If you already have an application working, for example, with Apache Cassandra, it will just work with Scylla. And here is a, a quick list of our, some of our uh, a customer, you can see there are many in many domains, so I won't uh, waste time on it. Uh, so the agenda for today, I already introduced Scylla to you guys. Um, the, in the next step, I'm going to give a very high level description of what is NoSQL and SQL. I will try to speed up this part because I'm sure many, is many of you are familiar with that. And then we're going to um, explain the problem uh, that we come to solve in the consistency problem. Uh, then Kostya will explain how we solve the problem using the draft consensus algorithm, demonstrate it on, on schema and topology changes, and then touch a little bit about the next step and Q&A. Um, so, so a very brief history of uh, databases. Um, 
database have a very long history. It's actually started before the 70s, but become very popular or commoditized in the 70s with relational database or SQL compatible database. SQL is great. It gives you a lot of properties, uh, acid to name one, join to, to name two. So uh, a lot of nice property, but somewhere in the 2000s, this uh, relational database model broke. And why does it broke? Scale. At some point, the amount of data or internet scale of data uh, was not fit into uh, one machine. So you have to move from a single machine, even a very strong machine, to a distributed model when the database run or deploy on many, many nodes. It was, if you remember, it started with uh, two nodes, four nodes, Oracle have a, a small cluster in a rack and this kind of solution and, and very quickly become like a, a huge, bigger and bigger clusters. And that was the introduction of NoSQL. NoSQL um, tried to, to mitigate and, and uh, deploy data in a distributed way but on the process, of course, it's a trade-off. It has to relax some of the uh, requirement, like ACID and others that come uh, with relational database. Apache Cassandra is one of the more popular first wave of NoSQL that become popular. And CLADB, you can think about it as a second wave of NoSQL built on the uh, property, some of the property of uh, Cassandra, but improve on other properties. Another way to look at uh, the timeline of a uh, NoSQL database is uh, using the hardware uh, uh, update in this uh, phase. When Cassandra was designed uh, in uh, 2008, most machine was one core, two core, four cores, and not much more than that. But as you all know, in recent years, the number of core per machine jump to the sky and it's look like it, it's only going to increase. And, and later databases like Scylla was actually designed from scratch to support and to run well on this kind of a multi-core machine. Scylla actually have an implementation that use a shard per core that really scale linearly with the number of cores. Uh, so NoSQL is a huge domain that there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of, of NoSQL databases. Uh, I try in this, uh, in the next two slides to, to map this is a zoo of, of uh, NoSQL database on, on two dimensions. The first dimension is complexity uh, from a key value uh, data modeling to document store like MongoDB to wide column store like uh, DynamoDB, HBase, and Scylla. And there are many, many more type of databases, time series database, graph database, and other. And I apologize in advance, everything that I'm showing in the next uh, two slides, note that this one is simplification. Uh, you can think of DynamoDB, for example, as a key value as well. Uh, you can think of Aerospike as a wide column. So uh, apologies in advance for, for the expert on the crowd for this uh, simplification. A, a second uh, a dimension which you can think about NoSQL, which is more relevant to our presentation, is using the CAP theorem, which try to module a database or NoSQL database based on a trade-off between availability and consistency. Uh, if you try to map a NoSQL database based on that, Scylla will be on the side of the availability. Uh, Scylla support what is called eventual consistency, and I will explain what it is in the next few slides. Uh, but basically, it means that if a few of the nodes are down, Scylla is still available, still can give you service, uh, but maybe with uh, less uh, consistency. Uh, oops, just a second. Um, this is again a simplification and, and later uh, work done on, on uh, consistency in the CAF theorem show more granular model that compare not just availability and consistency, but also compare consistency to performance. Because if you think about it, availability is very relevant, but only if you have failure on the cluster. If all the nodes are running and all the data centers are, are running smoothly, uh, there is still a, a huge difference between the algorithm of the databases because a consistent database usually send more messages and, and work harder, if you will, to keep consistency. While if you only need to keep availability, maybe you can send less messages and have a better performance. And, and I will very quickly demonstrate what is event, eventual consistency of data in Scylla. And I'm, I'm showing it here with the read operation, but it's very similar to a write operation. 
So think about a client or an application that uh, read from uh, the Scylla database. In Scylla, all the nodes are completely symmetric. So a random node acts as a coordinator. In this case, I have a replication factor of three, uh, which is typical, and that means that the data is replicated to three nodes in the cluster, not to all the nodes. You can have hundreds no of nodes in a cluster, but to three of the nodes. Uh, so the request comes to the coordinator. The coordinator using a hash function know which other node have the information, replicas as we call them. He send a request, uh, and again, it's a simplification, but he send a request to all three nodes, get the response in this case from one and the two other response fail. And now the question is, should the coordinator return a response back to the client or should he let the client know that the operation failed because the data might not be fully consistent because he got it just from one node. And that's depend on what is called consistency level. Consistency level in Scylla is per session or per request even, it's tunable. And that means that the client can determine when he send the request if he want the consistency of quorum, all or one, and even more granularity. So in this case, let's imagine that the consistency level is one, and that means that the coordinator can wait only for one response. And once this response go to the coordinator, he can send the response. Oop, I jumped too fast. He can send the response back to the client. So this is the, the tunable consistency in one data center. And a very similar view there is with multi-data center. Uh, Scylla support uh, very nicely a multi-data center when each data center can be in a completely different region around the world. Uh, usually your application are uh, located on each data center as well. So for example, application that run on a US region will query and update the US region cluster or data center and the update to other data center will be completely offline. And the consistency level can be different in each, in each data center, as you can see here. Uh, one of our customers that uh, use this uh, multi-region uh, deployment is uh, Kiwi. And uh, uh, Kiwi actually had an actual uh, disaster in one of their data center. The data center simply went on fire I won't mention the, the host name, but you can quickly Google it. A, and you can see that even though a, a 10 of the nodes out of 30 are down, the cluster was, was uh, continued to serve and request because it was deployed in a high availability manner and they use consistency level of either one or a local quorum. So everything should everything continue to work uh, very smoothly. And, and you can go and look for the Kiwi blog post they publish uh, the incident story about this uh, this uh, fire. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, and maybe that will be a segue to to Costia section, that uh, when we're talking about a consistency in a, in a distributed cluster, many people think uh, as the first thing about the data, and that that's probably too because you, in uh, true because you care about your data. But if you think about it, a cluster or a database hold more than just the data; it also have metadata. So two examples for such metadata information, one is the schema and one is the topology. So uh, as you know, and, and this is true not just for Scylla, for many other databases, before you start provisioning and reading data, you have to set uh, the schema with the tables and type and the indexes, and the same is true for Scylla. But if you think that each of the application on each region can actually update the schema on its own, uh, you need eventual consistency for schema as well. And that can work in, in uh, most of the cases, but on failure cases or, or a slow latency, uh, it can actually get out of consistency for the schema. And this is an actual problem that we've seen with uh, Scylla customers. And it's true for many other distributed databases without naming names, but the schema consistency can be as much of a problem as a data consistency. And with that, I will switch to, to Kostya to uh, take it from here. Thanks, Tzach. Uh, let me just take over the screen. Uh, I think you can see my screen now, right? Uh, can you see my screen? 
Excellent. So, uh, yes, as uh, Tsav mentioned, the, there is this uh, 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 problem with the eventual consistency of metadata. And uh, in my part of the talk, I will try to explain how we currently manage uh, metadata such as scheme and like first what first of all what it is how we currently manage it and uh, what we can get from changing uh, the algorithms from eventual to strong uh, for this kind of data data and how we can combine the uh, two like have strong consistency of metadata and eventual consistency for data uh, to get the best of the of both worlds so as Tsaha already said, like uh, what is uh, uh, what is uh, schema, and uh, schema usually just uh, used to mean uh, simply the column types of the tables, right? And uh, uh, mostly it was used for relational databases to uh, to actually save on storage because you can only store the schema information once and uh, you use it for every row in the database but uh, uh, come to think of it like in the modern world it's not just the the column types it's the indexes it's the views it's the access rights and it's also the power of the data definition verbs so like uh, what you can do with your database with just a single verb like alter table and and the create index and so on and uh, just from the nature of it, uh, replicating schema statements uh, has to use its own write path. So when you create a table, you connect to a single node, probably from the client, or create a key space, as in this example. But this got to replicate to all of the nodes. And uh, uh, with the eventual consistency model, uh, each node can have a slightly different version of the schema. You cannot stop the world for just uh, creating a table or creating an index or just changing a permission on a table. So from that, uh, we need to consider the, the right paths, how the, the, this actually, the data is actually replicated and uh, what happens when the different nodes in the database, they have a slightly different version of the schema. So the way Silla handles it, is that it uses gossip to propagate the schema information. And uh, it actually uses multiple mechanisms. So gossip is an eventual, is a, is a, an epidemic protocol that is eventually consistent. It's a, it, it's a flavor of an eventual consistent protocol. So the way it works is that you first create the schema fully at one of the nodes, and that then that data is sort of migrated to other nodes in an eventually consistent manner. Uh, with that, it can happen that uh, a request comes to a coordinator which has a newer version of the schema than one of the replicas. And uh, Scylla would convert data on the fly if, the, if uh, one of the replicas has a newer version uh, to the client version of the schema. If one of the replicas has an older version, it can dynamically discover that when serving the request and convert its schema version, upgrade its schema version on the fly and then serve the request. So this is all happening under the hood, but still this kind of reconciliation uh, is, uh, is eventually consistent in nature. And sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad. Let me show you why. So consider an example when the, um, uh, like the failure example for this scenario I've just described. So. The advantage of the approach when that you can create a schema while you as soon as you can uh, change the schema as soon as you can connect to one of the nodes is that uh, you just need one of the nodes to make progress one of the nodes to make progress and uh, the disadvantage obviously is that you can concurrently uh, create different versions of the schema so this all of this is uh, reconciled in an eventual manner so imagine uh, like the failure scenario when uh, not just some of the node is simply down, but there is a network partitioning. And different clients, for whatever reason, create different versions of the schema. So in my example, I create an email in one client, and if I add an email column in one client, to add, add a phone column in another client. There is a, an, a reconciliation algorithm which would create a, a, a united schema that would contain both columns and uh, try to salvage the data that was inserted during this network partitioning event into both of the columns. So this is good stuff, uh, can be actually quite useful. Uh,
just one example of how eventual consistency can be good for your application. But there is also not so good scenario when uh, like reconciliation I've just described is impossible. Uh, there are many scenarios like that. So one is uh, I'm showing in this slide, it's like when you rename a column uh, and uh, you try to insert uh, data into the name column and uh, in an isolated environment, like when the, your node or set of nodes is partitioned from the rest of the cluster, this actually can succeed. And uh, uh, but later, uh, you probably, uh, if you have a you know a different definition of the same column at a different schema, you have to reconcile the two. And if there is no way to reconcile because it's just the same column, right? Probably with the same name and maybe slightly different type. Uh, what what Scylla does is just select the definition with the latest timestamp. So that also means that all of the data that was inserted into the into the um, uh, version that is shadowed is also shadowed with the version. So you might actually, uh, in a way, lose your data if you uh, if you do this, uh, you, know, you know, changes to the schema which are impossible to reconcile. So the benefit of uh, um, availability has the cost of uh, potential you know, difficulty to use, difficulty to understand. The schema reconciliation algorithms are, it's not something that is, you know, documented, defined, it's hard to define. The latest timestamp wins, of course, but the, like what is the, going to be the actual effect for this is, is something that is hard to comprehend. So it's a best effort to patch up for something that is otherwise undefined. So with topology changes, the, uh, the problem is similar. So to uh, uh, you should be able to perform some topology changes when, so when some of the nodes are down. So the question is how useful it is to you that the topology change information is propagated in an eventual consistent, in an eventually consistent manner. So, but first define what is topology and uh, uh, Tzach already described that uh, there is some uh, way to ensure redundancy of the data by replicating it to multiple nodes and it doesn't mean all of the nodes in the cluster so it uh, depends on your replication factor how many nodes uh, contain a copy of the data so the actual location of data the the, the uh, in the indices and racks uh, the mapping of the data to the specific nodes the mapping of the uh, nodes to DCs and racks and uh, also the replication factor all of these define topology together so if you have, uh, say, uh, specifically like a cluster of 10 nodes and uh, your replication factor is three, it's one location of the data. If your replication factor is one or say five, it's, it's you know, it's, these are can be different nodes in the cluster or just more nodes, in the, more or less nodes in the cluster. So uh, the topology information is represented what is called token metadata. Uh, this, uh, this is, uh, a way to numerically represent the, the distribution. So each key that doesn't matter in what table it's stored, each key is mapped to a number by means of hashing. And that number has to be assigned to one or more replicas, one or more nodes in the cluster. The way it is assigned is that each node is also mapped to a, to a more or less random hash number. And basically when the key maps to a range uh, between an, a token owned by this node and then token owned by the next node, it, it means that it belongs to the node. So this is how it, it is defined where the data location is stored. So uh, this is an illustration of, of what I just said. So, um, Every node decides on a set of tokens when it bootstraps. And when you combine all of the tokens from all of the nodes, you get the actual token metadata. So the full information about the ream. Because then you know which, which uh, node is, uh, which range is owned by which node. And when you combine it with the token met, with the replication metadata, you actually, uh, with the replication strategy, you actually have the actual, the mapping of the data. 
just like with schema, SolidDB allows different nodes of the cluster to have a different view of the topology. I, this naturally happens since you want to allow uh, you know, a single node to process a topology change, to coordinate a topology change, and all of the other nodes, they cannot learn about it immediately. You cannot stop the world for just making a topology change. And eventually consistent propagation means potentially stale topology. So some coordinators might operate uh, using some older version of the topology. The good news is that the way you work with the topology is just uh, always forward progress. You don't revert the changes of the topology. So eventually all of the nodes in the cluster, they do agree on the topology. They just might get the stale topology in certain scenarios. And then it becomes the job of the coordinator to work this around. Let me give you a specific example uh, when the nodes uh, can actually have a stale topology and when it can impact the correctness of your, of your data. So suppose you have a cluster of three nodes. Initially, all the three nodes are up and have the same view of the topology. And then the cluster goes down. And uh, uh, then all, all nodes, except uh, one of the nodes, node C, uh, they go up, but node C remains down. Uh, the, uh, the, the token metadata is persisted in every node, but it's also uh, distributed, uh, gossiped across nodes using the, 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 the epidemic algorithm. So since node C is down, Node A and B, they have the full view of the topology, but nobody is telling, like say, new nodes about uh, tokens of node C because each node is responsible for gossiping its own tokens. Imagine you add a new node, node D, to this. Node D will get, uh, will generate its own tokens, uh, gossip it to all of the live nodes, but will not, not get the information about the tokens of node C. So in the end, you can get an inconsistent view of the topology between the, uh, uh, you know, what D actually knows and what uh, other nodes actually, what other nodes have. This is of course not good because uh, like different coordinators will use different quorums and this can cause inconsistent reads and uh, writes may also go to wrong replicas temporarily. But eventually node C will go up, uh, it will synchronize the topology and, uh, and uh, in an eventually consistent environment, you also su are supposed to regularly run repair. So uh, with repair, uh, you will eventually solve this problem. But moreover, uh, this scenario shouldn't happen. You cannot bootstrap a new node if there is a node down in the cluster. This is something that's strictly documented in a SILA manual, so you just are not supposed to do it. But uh, it's also racy. You know, uh, you can start by checking the status and then proceed to bootstrapping, and in the middle of bootstrap, the node can go down. This is unlikely, but it's still possible. So uh, what we would like to get, just like with schema changes, we would like to make a trade-off. So we'd like to have a, a majority of the nodes in the cluster decide on the changes of schema and topology. It's not uh, the extreme liveness uh, that currently is present in Scylla with eventual consistency. So you require the majority. You cannot make progress if you just have a few nodes in the cluster available, but it, uh, ha have, it has some nice properties of uh, linearizability that we can build using some strong, uh, strongly consistent algorithms on top of, the, of that. So in the next section, I will describe how we actually do that. So Raft is an algorithm that we used for strong consistency in Scylla 5.0. And let's, let me explain it in a bit more detail. Uh, Raft is actually, mm, is not a decision-making protocol. It's a protocol for what's called a state machine replication. What is a state machine? Uh, a state machine is essentially a program that takes inputs and produces outputs. And the idea is that if you uh, feed inputs uh, in the you know in the same order to the state machine, you're going to you're going to get the predictable outputs from it. And a replicated state machine uh, is a way uh, to 
is he, the idea of a replicated state machine is to um, is to distribute the copies of the same state machine among many nodes and uh, make sure the majority of these nodes have the same state and make sure that the nodes transition from state to state in the same order. The state machine state in this case is going to be schema information like what tables you have, what indexes are, are out there and, and you know privilege and so on. The topology information, what tokens are out there, what nodes are out there, which nodes are joining and living and so on. So I mentioned that uh, the idea is that state machine state should transition in the same order. How to actually achieve that? Uh, a replicated log can help make sure that, uh, sure that state machine executes commands in the, exactly the same order. A client uh, of the system that wants to execute a command, say create a table, passes that command to one of these machines. The command, let's call it X, gets recorded in the log on the local state machine. And then in addition, the command is passed to other state machines and recorded in their logs as well. So before the command is actually executed, it's first persisted in the log. This guarantees that the majority preserves the uh, the, the log, uh, you know, in uh, in case of node failures, and uh, can read the log from other nodes and uh, preserve the same order, in, you know, in, in joining and living node, uh, nodes. Once the command has been safely replicated in the logs, it can be passed to the state machines for execution. And then, when, when one of the state machines, usually the the uh, server of the client, has finished execution, the result can be returned back to the client. The job, there is a special module called the consensus module, which job is to handle failures, make sure the commands are replicated in the same order, and handle uh, things like joining or leaving nodes. The whole system can make progress as long as any majority of the servers is up and can communicate with each other. So it's, it means the majority in this case means two out of three, three out of five, and so on. Uh, in Raft, the servers are not equal at any given point in time. Uh, clients, they communicate with the leader, and the leader communicates with other servers to replicate commands. This decomposes the problem of consensus into two, the normal operation when there is a running leader and what you do when the leader crashes and one needs to elect a new leader. In Scylla, we actually uh, transparently forward these uh, schema change commands to the current leader as we know it. So you can connect to any node and execute uh, the schema change command. What I'm explaining here is how it works under the hood. So let's uh, look a bit more closely at what happens when the leader has to change. It's the leader's job to ping all of the nodes and uh, tell them that, uh, hey, I'm alive. You should not run an election. You should not try to become a leader. When a leader dies, these pings, they naturally stop. And every node is programmed with a random uh, election timeout that, to start a new election when it doesn't get these pings. Because the election timeout is randomized, uh, nodes, they actually start an election at a slightly different times. So say you haven't heard from the leader for 10, I don't know, intervals, 10 seconds. And uh, at 11th second, uh, node S1 starts an election. At the 12th second, node S2 starts an election, and so on. And there can be only one election in a given election term. And uh, time is uh, uh, you know, strictly monotonic in RAF, so every election increments the current term. And that makes sure that uh, you know you can vote for only one node at a time uh, uh, during a given election. Kostya, what happens? Mm -hmm. You say it's randomized, but what happens if two uh, nodes uh, decide to start the election at the same time? Yeah. So in that case, you can actually get a split vote. So uh, its situation is entirely possible. And uh, in uh, November 2020, Cloudflare recorded a few hour outage due to uh, like a prolonged failure to elect a leader. But uh, the way we, the modern raft actually addresses that with a special extension called pre-voting, uh, which uh, uh, ensures liveness even in like fairly quick convergence to election of a leader, even in presence of split votes. And uh, in Scylla, we actually address that. We have tests which run elections in a thousand node cluster 
and they converge fairly quick. So, um, uh, you know, some people, some there, there, there are some uh, developers, engineers who criticize RAD for this asymmetry, but uh, you know, some engineering can actually deal with it quite well. One other reason why we chose chose Raft is that uh, joining and leaving, uh, uh, like changing the topology, is also core part of the core of the algorithm. In order to add or remove a node in Raft, the client applies a special command to the log. In this, uh, in, in the slide, it's the illustration is like add node D, or and that command is replicated. Uh, among uh, and or with all of the other commands, all of the data, manip data manipulation commands. And as soon as other nodes, they learn about the topology change, they actually apply it. And uh, um, uh, this makes sure that all of the topology changes are also applied in a linearizable manner. Silverapt uses an uh, the there are like there are simple and uh, joint topology changes, joint topology changes in Raft allow you to essentially transition configuration from, you know, into arbitrarily different ones. So you can transition a cluster of nodes A, B, C to a cluster of nodes uh, D, E, F, you know, and uh, uh, this makes sure that you can safely do things like replacing a node or uh, adding a node in, uh, in a small cluster. And we also implemented another extension to make sure that there is liveness when adding nodes in small clusters. Uh, the uh, This extension to Raft is called uh, support for non-voting members. Imagine you just have a tiny cluster with just a single node and you want to add another node to it. And fine, uh, the node is uh, successfully added to the uh, Raft uh, quorum and now be is, uh, begins participating in elections. And you begin moving data to that node. When moving data, there is some kind of a failure, so you run out of disk space, and full joining of the node cannot complete. In this case, you could get, uh, you know, a stuck cluster. You require a majority of two nodes to actually even remove node B, but uh, you don't have it because B is stuck. So the way we handle that is that nodes first join as a non-voting member, so the quorum still requires just a single node to make progress. And then when the streaming is complete, they convert to voting members. This completes the introduction of uh, uh, the core of the raft and some of the silly extensions. And the next, in the next part of the talk, I'd like to uh, explain how we actually adopt it to combine eventual consistency with a strong consistency, get the best of the both, both worlds. Uh, I already mentioned that topology changes are part of Raft core. So this greatly simplifies uh, and makes uh, safe and linearizable uh, node operations such as adding, removing, and decommissioning a node. But also there's another algorithm that we implemented that transition to Raft and we call this algorithm cluster discovery. The idea of this is that now you could bootstrap all of the nodes in the cluster concurrently in a fresh cluster and allow them to assemble into, into a group automatically. The way we handle this is by building a transitive closure of all of the peers in the cluster before actually configuring any of the nodes in the cluster. So that when we do configure the node, uh, the first node of the cluster, we can uh, we are certain uh, what the nodes in the cluster are, and we can create safely create the first uh, uh, raft configuration. Let me use an example to illustrate that. Imagine you have a cluster of five nodes, and uh, each node is just put in for the first time, and each node has uh, a set of uh, discovery hints or peers that it will try to connect with to uh, before it actually decides to form a new cluster or join an existing cluster. And in this illustration, these are nodes two and three. So before the node creates a new cluster or joins the cluster, it connects to these nodes and asks about all of the nodes available or known to node two and three. Naturally, two and three quickly discover all of the nodes in the cluster and quickly start sharing this information with all the rest of the nodes. One, there is no new information in 
you know, in a subsequent exchange round, we know that we is, this discovered everybody in the cluster. So uh, the criteria is that you have connected to everybody that's on your list and you have got responses from everybody on your list and you haven't got new nodes and you haven't extended the list of known peers. In this case, you can safely build a new cluster. So that's the algorithm we adopted to uh, make the cluster bootstrap safer and faster. When you add or remove nodes to the cluster, you also have a linearizable state of the state machine to, to make progress. And the way it works is that uh, we call this state machine RAV group zero. Uh, this has to do with our future plans to use RAV for data as well. So this is the first draft application. So th this is why it's called group zero. And uh, 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 token metadata is managed by the state machine associated with that RAV group. This group includes the entire cluster. Before making the change to the topology, we actually read the latest state of the group. So we always know the latest state by connecting with the majority of the cluster. And this obviously solves the problem of uh, divergent topology information at different nodes when joining a new node. And then we uh, extend that information. We commit a change to raft uh, replicated log to add or remove or decommission a node. Schema changes. Uh, um, just a second. Uh, schema changes, uh, they uh, also now use raft. And uh, they also read the take a raft read barrier to get uh, to get the latest uh, in information. But they also use a trick uh, which we call state ID tracking, which in in guarantee is that each schema change executes at most once, and uh, we never end with the latest state of the database. Let me explain how we do it. Uh, we sign every schema change in, a, in the entire cluster with a unique timestamp, unique time UUID. And we require to apply a schema change that the previous time UUID matches our records that uh, we created when building this mutation for a schema change. So if there is a mismatch, we do not apply, we skip applying and we retry applying. And this guarantees that, say, if you try to create a table and there is already a table in the cluster, with the same name, you're going to get the proper error. If you are dropping a table and there is no table with this name, you're also going to get a proper error. You're not going to be quietly, you know, silenced and uh, not know what the latest state of the of the database is. And there are of course retries in case there was a leader failure when uh, when trying to apply this command or a cluster reconfiguration or something like that. So any kind of uncertainty. And uh, uh, of course, this is great stuff, but how we actually, how, how we change the way data changes work? How we, um, did we manage to keep the data uh, operations as quick as they used to be and as available as they used to be since they now depend on this strictly consistent schema which requires the majority of the cluster? And the good news is that no, we don't, uh, we actually, preserve the availability of data manipulation commands. We handle that by uh, being able to convert data on the fly as before to the right schema. But this time we actually fetch the latest linearizable state uh, from, the, uh, from one of the followers. We don't require the uh, connection to the leader. We uh, fetch the latest committed state of the schema and topology from the leader when we discover like say this replica's uh, state is out of date. So every request, every read or write request continues to be signed with a schema hash. A schema hash is like a small signature that uh, allows the replica to verify that its schema hash matches the coordinator schema hash and if there is a mismatch, we can fetch the latest uh, uh, information from the coordinator of the write. The other good part is that we, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the, uh, the illustration. The other good part is uh, that we uh, also were able to get rid of uh, gossip's uh, weights. So there was this famous uh, uh, parameter skip weight for gossip to settle, which you could tune to speed up put. Now you don't, essentially you don't depend on it. 
and uh, for topology changes are now also much, much faster. So to recap, uh, concurrent DDL is now safe. The uh, uh, safe topology changes, they make us bring us closer to a fully automated elastic cluster when we can dynamically add and remove nodes as the load changes. The feature is still under experimental features uh, equals raft and it's enabled if all of the it's it's available in 5.0 and it's enabled if all of the nodes are uh, in the same version. There is one problem that this does introduce so uh, nothing nothing comes you know entirely there is no no progress that is uh, that is with, without the cost. So in case you have uh, you know clusters in two different data centers, not three, not four, like but exactly two, a cluster failure can lead to a split brain situation. And uh, with, you can uh, today you can do data manipulation commands with this, such a split brain cluster. You cannot do topology changes, which is sad in in such a situation. But you can build a new cluster using the data you have. Uh, if this situation doesn't recover. And I would actually be curious to know how much this is of an impact to you. So if you run uh, clusters into data centers and you are concerned with this, so please send a comment or a question. So, uh, uh, so with that, I'll pass back to Zach and... Uh, thanks. All right, yeah. thanks, Kostya. Uh, so, qu quick summary, can you switch to the next one, Kostya? Next slide. So, quick recap of what we've seen. Uh, so, first, I gave you a, a really high-level view of what is NoSQL and eventual consistent. Then we explain some of the problem that uh, Scylla and other databases currently have with consistency of schema and topology changes. Then we introduce a solution to this problem using the raft consensus algorithm. And last, if a few of the issue that the new issue that this algorithm may present, the current status of raft that, uh, in Scylla it, uh, it completely implemented in 5.0. You can actually consume it in the 5.0 release candidate and play with it with the schema changes. And with time, we uh, we will add to it uh, topology changes and finally uh, strongly consistent uh, data changes. I do want to mention that topology changes, for example, seem to some of you theoretical because you have maybe small cluster and you don't change the topology as often but for us as a database as a service provider we manage a lot of databases and we want to be able to quickly scale up and quickly scale down so this uh, the consensus and, and the scaling become more and more critical for us and uh, with that uh, let's uh, turn to, to Q&A Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Kastia, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have some questions, but I want to kind of uh, quickly summarize, you know, so uh, great discussion on uh, very important uh, aspects of data management in, uh, especially in the NoSQL database use cases. You know, you guys talked about uh, managing the consistency and resiliency at uh, three different levels. Data, schema, and topology, so which is very important when you have uh, a distributed database that you are working, uh, uh, you are using for your applications. Uh, also regarding the consistency, immediate consistency versus eventual consistency. It's always one of the big challenges, right? You know, which one is uh, uh, better for which use case and how do we get a good balance between those two? And the Scylla DB uh, you mentioned, you know, is, is a really good option to uh, kind of balance out those kind of perceivingly conflicting uh, uh, requirements, right? So um, yeah, I will start with a couple of questions. Um, we can start with the audience questions first. So I think you already talked about this. Uh, uh, Mahesh uh, has a question on uh, how to avoid disruption of a leader by an unstable member in the cluster. Uh, I don't know this, if this is uh, happened, you know, uh, in one of your uh, kind of what you have seen before. But uh, can an unstable we do member have in a cluster uh, disrupt a leader? Simulations uh, for that and uh, uh, pre-voting algorithm that we uh, support as an extension and it's always on. Uh, so it's part of our core uh, implementation. It does uh, guarantee that, uh, you know, 
the leader doesn't step down just because there is this unstable node which tries to elect itself a leader because it, this unstable node has to first ask the, the quorum to give it a permission to start an election. So this is uh, something we wanted to address and we have tests for and we believe we solved. Yeah, definitely this is not a peer-to-peer -peer or uh, like a master worker type of architecture where a worker node can take over the master responsibility. Right? This is more of a quorum, more a democracy type of based uh, architecture, right? So. Yeah, right. in Scylla, uh, by the way, one of the principles in Scylla, even before the, if the rough the discussion, that all nodes are symmetric, uh, which make uh, management easier. You don't have many types of, of nodes as you have in uh, some other configurations. Right, yeah, that definitely uh, it's more uh, resilient compared to uh, like a master worker architecture that uh, MongoDB and other databases have, right? So, okay. Uh, the next yeah, question I, is I also didn't from... want I didn't want to mention other databases, but uh, <laughs> if you, if you did, uh, yes, you're right. It's more resilient. Yeah, yeah. yeah just to compare from an architectural pattern standpoint. Uh, the next question is also from Mahesh. Uh, how do we support multi-master across multi-region? Uh, are there two leaders across two regions? You know, how are the leaders uh, uh, leader uh, nodes kind of managed or managed between the regions? So. It is still a single leader uh, for two regions. And uh, we have to keep in mind that um, many of the operations, they are still, the, the role of the leader is to replicate the command to the log. So the actual schema changes, they don't over, overload the leader. Uh, the, uh, and the rate of the schema or topology changes is not the rate of data changes. We continue to scale linearly with the data writes or and reads. So the idea here is that uh, the follower, the, the follower node, the replica node, which received the command from the client that prepares fully the transaction, sends it to the single leader that it is aware of, that it's keeping track of, probably in a different region indeed. And that leader then rep persisted uh, this command in its log and replicates it to all other rep replicas and the follower, the, the original replica, uh, will just uh, get that command in its replicated log. And as soon as it gets it, it gets the command in the replicated log, the in committed state, it will apply it and reply it to the client. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Do. Uh, the question is, uh, is your metadata strong consistency limited to a single data center or is it uh, across the cluster? Uh, it's entire it's cluster. At the top, across the cluster, yes. Good. The next question from Mahesh uh, is, what are the advantages of Raft? Uh, you talked about Raft protocol uh, for the consistency. Uh, what's the, what are the advantages of Raft over Gossip protocol implemented in uh, Cassandra uh, database? So uh, I mentioned that Gossip is eventually consistent and it's much, much slower. In Gossip, you periodically exchange the application state. In this case, it's called the application state. In Raft, this thing is called the state machine state between uh, participant nodes. And uh, the ring timeout is the time that in all practical circumstances gives you the uh, guarantee that this replication happens. So it's 30 seconds. So uh, you probably saw this with uh, say Cassandra when you create a table and this actually resolves quickly but then you try to write immediately to that table and this says that the table doesn't exist yet. And this is because Gossip hasn't replicated that table to some other replica that serves as the coordinator for the write. So this uh, situation is not uh, possible with Raft. It's uh, as soon as you got the, the information that the uh, table is created, and this happens quite quickly because the the leader is responsible for pushing the replic the, the the logs to all of the followers. Doesn't uh, you know retries immediately and so on. So it's it's way more aggressive than gossip. Uh, you already are you already know that the table is there. You can use it. By the way, yeah, I want thanks, to mention uh, one thing. I'm keeping always keeping uh, one eye on the Cassandra mailing list as well, and two eyes on Sarah. I have three eyes actually. 
so they are, they are well aware of, of this and they are also looking for a way to, to improve it on Cassandra as well. And maybe they will do something similar to Scylla or maybe we'll take another track in the future. Maybe yeah, they use a, a symmetric what? protocol which they have been considering like uh, this uh, protocol for transactions. It's up to them. So we could discuss the differences between symmetric and asymmetric and the why we chose asymmetric in our case have been interesting yeah i know from uh, what i have seen like a lot of the database are uh, definitely switching to uh, raft you know versus gossip so like you said uh, Zach, it can be a really uh, good topic for a future you know uh, forum okay yeah, we do have a few more uh, questions you know let's uh, uh, kind of go to them um, the next question is how do we pitch raft is better than zookeeper leader protocol uh, I know Zookeeper is used for like coordination of the nodes. I don't know, can are they comparable? Um, and uh, uh, why Raft why is not? better than Zookeeper? Why not? So Zookeeper uses Zab, uh, which is a variant of multi paxes and uh, we actually implement paxes for lightweight transactions. So we are very familiar with this uh, protocol. And uh, uh, well, the biggest. Uh, so I think there was this even uh, one of the papers that even mentioned uh, Zab as an example of uh, how uh, far away is the actual implementation from the theoretical specification of a protocol. And uh, so uh, the good news about Draft is that it has a formal specification and uh, it's been validated using formal validation tools. It can be actually fairly certain that this is. Uh, mm, you know this this works and uh, the other advantage of raft for us uh, is that uh, as i mentioned you have this configuration changes that is topology changes that are part of the core protocol and you don't have to uh, invent them essentially in your own way because there is no formal specification for configuration changes with paxos anywhere so and other than that you can actually view um, what we have on board as a built-in zookeeper. From functionality point of view, it's like a built-in zookeeper into, into Scylla. We even are considering having uh, tables of providing that functionality to clients as like create table uh, replicated everywhere, consistent, and you write into the table and the data appears on all, all of the nodes. So we might do that as well. Yeah, but by the way, other databases, or uh, streaming services that do use Zookeeper are, are consider removing it uh, because the added complexity of managing both the streaming service and the Zookeeper. So there are advantages and disadvantages for each approach. Uh, so people are definitely looking into this trade-off. Yeah, definitely, Zach. I think Pulsar has uh, uh, pref uh, has chosen a Bookkeeper, right? Project versus a Zookeeper because of the advantages, you know, of bookkeeper or zookeeper, right? So definitely, there is a, that shift is happening. Also, to just to add to what uh, Kastia mentioned, you know, if anybody uh, would like to compare these different alternatives, uh, you can always uh, do your own testing using Scylla in your own environment and see uh, how it works. And that's the best way to, you know, convince your uh, leadership in your organization, right? Uh, like working uh, software, right? So uh, demo software, but still a uh, functional software, right? So. Uh, the next question um, is from Bharat. Um, I think we already know the answer to this, but I, I will uh, uh, kind of let you guys uh, comment on this. Will the Raft uh, algorithm replace Gossip uh, protocol? Uh, how strongly Raft versus Gossip is related? Okay, so there are actually three parts of Gossip. Uh, one is uh, the health, uh, health check information. So, uh, propagating the uh, information about what, which nodes are alive, which nodes are dead. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it used to be epidemic in Cassandra. In Scylla, it used uh, what's called the direct failure detection algorithm, which is like we try every node tries to actually regularly connect with other, every other node. And uh, this is not as costly, but uh, is more accurate uh, in our environment and also allows us to, well, basically it allows us to, more, to quicker react to changes in the cluster topology. Uh, the other part of the gossip, and we are going to keep that. So, so for health checks, we're going to keep uh, 
I wouldn't call it gossip because gossip is an epidemic uh, algorithm. So that part of the subsystem we are going to keep. The part that's related to propagating the schema and topology state, we are going to essentially move and we are we have moved or, or and we will come com, you know continue moving so there are lots of parts in it like cdc tokens uh like uh uh, uh tokens of uh you know token metadata schema and so on schema hash so on. we are moving this over to uh, group zero state so in a way we are removing it Thank you, yeah, we're out of time, but yeah, let, let, let's take a few more, a couple of minutes to just kind of go one more question and I want to wrap it up after that. So last question uh, from Do as well is, uh, how much difference is Scylla DB performance on virtual machines versus bare metal machines? So I don't know if you guys so, have any benchmarks on that. Yeah, so, so we, do, we do have benchmark. I'm surprised people are still using bare metal. I thought everyone has moved to, to some of the cloud vendors. Uh, but, but yes, yeah, so you will get, on some cases, better performance on bare metal, but uh, the, the, the machine that you have on AWS right now when GCP and Azure are so strong uh, and uh, with, with strong SSDs and a lot of uh, and strong and uh, uh, wide uh, networks and such. And not only that, you, on all of the cloud, they are offering bare metal as well. Uh, so, so the, the difference is not as big and certainly you have huge, huge machine on, on all the, the cloud vendor, both bare metal and VM. And as I mentioned at the start, Scylla very nicely support a multi-core machine, like and I'm talking about 96 cores in a machine, Scylla will take advantage of all of them. And so, so running a million transaction per or request per second on a Scylla node is, is pretty easy and you actually don't need this super high uh, level machine for that. Right, and also you can auto provision VM instances. Uh, you can auto scale, right? So there are a lot of advantages. Yeah. Uh, so to, we are offering actually, if you go to the website, we are offering AMIs uh, for AWS images for GCP. So you can just we pre cook the the images for you. You have cloud formation that you can uh, use to run a cluster. So it's pretty straightforward, and and at least for me, easier to use. Sounds good. Yeah. Also with the um, these modern databases like SilaDB. Uh, like microservices and the serverless functions, you know, those are uh, becoming more uh, prevalent in application architectures. So you want to use a database that supports this consistency at all these different levels, because a microservice may not always have its own database. It may have its own schema in the same database, sharing with other microservices, right? So, so managing that at the schema level uh, will give that uh, independence uh, lifecycle to those microservices, right? So definitely something to watch out Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, kind of last question from me uh, is like, where can our audience learn more about Scylla DB database? What kind of educational material uh, they can find so on I the would, website? I would start, of course, there is documentation and there is a website and there are webinars, but I would actually start with Scylla University. Uh, you can uh, Google it. it it's, a, it's a website that gives you uh, lessons and courses from beginner level to expert level on Scylla, and, and you can follow a track. And if you follow the entire track, you also get a certificate of completion, which is pretty nice. And that, that's the starting point I would use for to learn about Sira. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Zach. Thanks, Kastia. So yeah, this is, uh, I think we're already a couple of minutes over. So thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, I hope it was the same for all our attendees. Uh, to our attendees, thank you for attending this webinar and submitting your questions. A lot of interactive discussion at the end of the presentation, which is which is what we would like to see in these discussions. And for our audience, you know, you are primarily developers and architects. You are the main reason why we host these webinars. Uh, we want to share uh, with you and the community the innovations happening in the software world. Uh, a lot of good stuff happening in the database uh, side of the things. Uh, so I would like to thank everybody for attending today. So thank you everyone, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Have a nice day, night.